Welcome everyone to CG seminar number 179. And we have a treat today. We have Professor Vicky Bolivar from Durham talking to us about uh, rethinking merit in the pursuit of fairer admission to universities in England. Vicky is Professor of Sociology and member of the Higher Education and Social Inequality Research Group at Durham University. And her research, which is well known to many of us, highlights socioeconomic and ethnic inequalities in rates of acceptance to highly selective UK universities among comparably qualified applicants, uh, has prompted the UK government to require universities to publish detailed admission statistics and to increase transparency and accountability. Vicky is someone who knows a lot about um, admissions and in particular about contextual admissions, and she will refer to that today. Um, her uh, work has been, I think, profoundly important in both clearly uh, explaining the situation of inequality, social and ethnic inequalities in UK, but also in working on the remedies, working on the strategies, good and bad, that may address it. Um, I'll hand over to Vicky in a moment. Let me take you through the webinar protocols briefly. Remember that the webinar is being recorded. It goes up on YouTube within 48 hours, often earlier than that. Uh, we also uh, post on our website, the chat from the webinar. So both those things are on the record. Um, now, when we go into the webinar proper, please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or you want to ask a question. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no need to have your video on during the webinar, um, but we'd like you to turn on your camera uh, and video settings when you are actually asking a question. We recommend using speaker view setting in Zoom so you can um, see who is talking at any given time. To ask a question, use the chat function, uh, put your question in writing, and we advise you to put your question forward early in the process. Towards the end of the, of the um, presentation is a good time because then we'll make sure that your uh, question does get into the Q&A discussion. Sometimes people come up with really great questions right at the end and we can't accommodate them. So do come in early or or up to about midway before the Q&A to make sure that you get um, the attention you deserve. We arrange the questions according to what comes in in the chat and the relevance to the, uh, the speaker's uh, topic. So at this point of time, great pleasure to hand over to my colleague, valued colleague and friend, Vicky Bolivar. Great, I'll just start sharing my screen. Hopefully you'll be able to see it in just a moment. Hopefully everyone can see that now. So yeah, thank you so much, Simon and the CG team for um, giving me this opportunity to talk today. Um, I wanna share with you uh, the findings of a research project we recently completed. And in fact, the report's being published today. Uh, it's work that was funded by the Nuffield Foundation. And the research focuses on universities in England that have courses, some or, or all of their courses are ones that have high academic entry requirements and a high demand for places. And what we were interested in exploring with these universities is how they think about fairness in relation to access and admissions. And we've been talking about fair access, fair admissions for several decades now. Uh, it's, a, it's been a term that's entered the uh, political discourse and policy discourse around widening access to higher education, at least since the mid 90s when the Office for Fair Access was created. Um, and I think it's a particularly interesting time to think about fairness in relation to admissions because what we've seen um, recently, let me see if I can move my slides on. Can I do that? Yes. Yes. Good, okay. What we've seen recently is that the, as you many of you will know, the Office for Fair Access was replaced in 2018 uh, with the Office for Students and the Office for Students very quickly announced that it'd be taking a new approach to regulating access. And one of the first things that it did, um, which I think is pretty unprecedented in, uh, in the UK and England was it set, um, more challenging widening access targets than ever before. And it aimed those targets specifically at higher tariff universities, which for quite a long time had only made very slow progress on uh, diversifying the socioeconomic backgrounds of their students. 
And so this unprecedented step to set targets specifically for higher tariff universities um, is a really uh, innovative and quite exciting move. And you'll know that uh, these ta targets are set in terms of the ratio of entrance to higher tariff universities who are from areas with the highest uh, rates of participation as compared to the lowest rates of participation. And across all higher tariff universities, uh, when these targets were first set, the ratio was something of the order of one, a uh, five to one ratio on average. And the Office for Students is asking higher tariff universities to move quickly to reduce this ratio to three to one by 2024 and to one to one uh, by 2038. So perfect equity of access, at least uh, in line with the, the area level measure that they're using. And one of the things that uh, the Office for Students has asked higher tariff universities to do as a means of achieving these stretching new targets is to rethink uh, how they judge merit uh, in the admissions process. Um, this is uh, recognizing the fact that high tariff universities have very high entry requirements and it's much less likely that people from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds and other underrepresented groups are likely to get the GCSE and A-level and A-level equivalent performance that puts them in the scope for eligibility for entry to these universities. So I want to talk about what it means to rethink merit. And I think we, it helps to start with what we have for a long time thought of uh, um, merit meaning in relation to higher education access. And I think for much of the 20th century and into this century, we've operated very much with uh, the traditional meritocratic equality of opportunity model of fair access and admissions. And this is linked to theories of the meritocratic society popularized by sociologists in the 1970s. It's become rather the do dominant paradigm in thinking about how societies work and how the stratification system works. Um, and what um, theories of, of meritocratic society say is that as societies develop and become more technologically dynamic, uh, the division of labor gets ever more complex, that we've been moving, and this is, this is true, we've been moving away from a stratification system where people's uh, occupational and social destinations depend on social ascription, i.e. You know, the, the, the families that they were born into and the social positions of their parents. And we've been moving away from that model towards individual achievement being the basis for uh, people's life chances and the occupations that they go on to, um, uh, to be eligible for and, and to take up. And theorists of meritocratic societies um, very much see this as a progressive development, that it means that um, societies are more efficient. We have uh, national education systems that allow everybody rather than those with the, the financial means um, personally to do so. And they allow everybody to uh, gain an education, to develop skills and competencies that are relevant for occupational and social positions. Um, and we increasingly, uh, according to this theory, have a, have a society in which people are more um, effectively uh, distributed across occupational and social positions uh, because it's, all, it's based on their individual achievements, their abilities, uh, their competencies that have been certified through the education system. And so occupational and social roles uh, are performed more, more efficiently. <clears throat> meritocratic systems are also seen to be more socially just because they're not based on circumstances of birth, they're based on um, what you as an individual have demonstrated that you're capable of, uh, particularly through credentials um, achieved in the education system. And if we think about how this applies to how we think about who should get to go to university, I think the, the, the dominant way of thinking about this is that university places should go to those who are the most highly qualified, you know, regardless of social background, it shouldn't matter uh, what your social class origin is, uh, your gender, your ethnicity, it's the most cert highly certified individuals who deserve those university places under this, under this model. And so when we look at how um, uh, universities select from among those applicants um, who present themselves for potential admission, the 
dominant way of thinking about how to fairly decide which applicants to admit has been in line with what you might think of as a kind of procedural fairness interpretation of what a fair admission systems mean. That is that all applicants are treated equally. They're all held to the very same high standard uh, and that their qualifications are seen as uh, objective indicators of their merit. Um, and it's those things that should be judged without taking any note of any other uh, things besides credentials. Now, I think it's fair to say that a meritocratic system is more efficient and more socially just than a, a caste-like system where occupations and, and life chances are merely handed down depending on circumstances of birth. But of course, meritocratic models of uh, equality of opportunity are highly problematic uh, in, in practice. Um, and that's really because we live in a very unequal society, right? We, we have massive and widening socioeconomic inequalities, uh, cultural and social inequalities. And so the idea that all individuals enjoy equality of opportunity to demonstrate merit through formal credentials um, is really an untenable assumption in the kinds of societies that, that, that we're operating in. Um, and I think one thing that really demonstrate this, this is uh, the longitudinal research that um, people like Claire Crawford and other economists have done where they've, they've looked at the, uh, achieve, the academic uh, test scores of pupils over the course of their school careers. And there's some very interesting work that shows that if you look at pupils age seven who are high achievers on national tests, if they're from high socioeconomic backgrounds, they'll continue to be high achievers in the national, national distribution throughout their school careers. But if they're low SES, uh, disadvantaged young people, then they, if they start at the, near the top of the national distribution of achievement, over time, they steadily fall down that distribution. And in fact, the research shows that by age 16, those low SES individuals who were judged to be of high ability are actually then being outperformed by high SES individuals who were merely average uh, at age seven. So we know that um, we know that socioeconomic inequalities in wider society do impact on um, the capacity of individuals to to demonstrate their true merit uh, through educational uh, qualifications and credentials. <clears throat> and what this means then, if given that we live in you know the real world rather than a um, the kind of world that we might uh, envisage if we're, if we're thinking about a pure meritocracy. What this means is that we can't think of fairness in terms of equality of opportunity. We have to substitute the word equality for equity of opportunity. And that is to say, we have to think about how do we compensate for um, the fact that people haven't had uh, genuine equality of opportunity to, to cultivate and demonstrate their merit? What can we do to truly recognize the, the unmet potential of people who had less advantaged social circumstances throughout their educational careers? And this also requires us to move towards um, a conception of fairness that's less about procedural fairness, treating everybody the same, holding everybody to the same high standard, uh, in terms of credentials, requiring everybody to have three A's at A-level if they want to do a particular course, and actually pursuing instead distributive fairness, um, a fairness that seeks to more fairly and justly allocate opportunities uh, and outcomes. Now, this means that, not that we do away with the idea of meritocracy altogether, we, we're still, uh, in this meritocratic equity of opportunity model, we're still you know, interested in um, identifying people who, um, who've done well in education, but we're interpreting that in light of the socioeconomic circumstances that individuals uh, have managed to uh, gain their credentials. So this is where contextualized admissions, uh, as was mentioned in, in the introduction comes in that a fairer way of thinking about who um, should be admitted to universities, including higher tariff ones, is to by all means look at people's prior credentials, but to assess those in light of the socioeconomic circumstances uh, in which they were obtained. And related to this, if we were going to have um, a fair 
access and admission system that operates under the meritocratic equity of opportunity model. What this means is that we also have to recognize that universities themselves have a, a really important role to play in developing potential that is as yet unrealized. So rather than universities simply uh, picking those people who are already high flyers and will definitely be able to succeed at university under their own steam without necessarily very much input from educators in universities that universities themselves have a teaching and a support role to play in, in, in helping people fulfill the potential that they have but that hasn't been yet realized uh, through their school careers. Okay, so taking these two different models of fairness in relation to admissions, let me tell you a bit about our study. So it has two strands and what's quite interesting uh, about how it played out in the end is that the first part of the research we conducted before the um, Office for Students was created and before uh, they called upon higher tariff universities to, to rethink merit. And then we were able to also look at uh, some more recent data to see how universities uh, are changing the way they think about merit and operationalize uh, fairness um, in their admissions practices. So we started off um, with in-depth interviews with admissions staff, and these interviews were conducted in 2017, uh, 2018 academic year. We sampled 17 universities in England, uh, mostly old universities, but we also included six new universities where we identified that the, they were universities where at least some of their courses uh, had high entry requirements and a high demand for places. Um, they're from every region throughout England, and we interviewed heads of admission at all of these institutions. Um, so, uh, there are 19 interviews with heads of admissions because the, we, at one institution, we interviewed uh, the previous and the, the current incumbent. Uh, in another institution, it was a split role. Uh, and we also interviewed 51 admissions selectors um, from a range of um, uh, high demand, high entry requirement courses across the, the, the arts um, and, and the sciences. And as I said, we were also able to um, follow that work up with uh, an analysis of the access and participation plans that uh, universities produced responding to the Office for Students call to rethink merit. And these are documents that replace the old access agreements that used to be produced annually. Um, and they look ahead to the period from uh, this academic year through to 2025. And for this part of the, the research, we honed in on the 25 universities identified as higher tariff providers by the Sutton Trust. 11 of those universities are ones included in our interview sample. Uh, the, the interview sample is anonymized. Um, we did that to encourage uh, our respondents to be very frank with us about the way they thought about fairness and, and their, their, their actual practices uh, under the hood, so to speak. Um, so those are anonymized, but the access and participation plans are public documents, so we don't anonymize the findings from those. And uh, I'll show you some uh, of our findings for both, uh, but importantly, it's a kind of before and after picture of how these universities think about merit and fairness. Okay, so let's start with uh, the interview data. <clears throat> what we saw when we spoke to heads of admissions and admission selectors were, was that in 2017-18, they were very much operating in line with that traditional meritocratic equality of opportunity model. So invariably, when we asked them, what is the purpose of the admissions function at this university? They said, our aim is to admit the best students. Um, and when we asked them what they meant by the best students, um, they said, those who we are highly confident will be able to uh, hit the ground running when they get here uh, and emerge at the other end with a degree, ideally a two, one or a first. So we, you know, we're looking for students who we're highly confident that they'll be able to succeed at degree level. And unsurprisingly, the evidence that they looked for um, to assure them of this was uh, prior attainment. And they're very much looking at A-level grades and other um, qualifications, because that to them was the thing that they were the best measure they had of whether somebody was going to uh, make a success of the degree program. 
And there was a really very heavy reliance on uh, prior and predicted attainment, so much so that as applications come to them throughout the, uh, the, admission, the, the admission cycle, there was almost, well, in many cases, the, the, there actually was a kind of ranking of applicants by their uh, uh, prior and predicted achievement. And those who were looked the most stellar on paper in terms of their credentials were the first um, to get places. They would um, reject very quickly the ones who they thought from past experience wouldn't be anywhere near uh, the mark that they were looking for and uh, they would hold on to the the ones that they, the kind of middle band uh, of, of applicants when ordered uh, from highest achieving to lowest achieving and they would decide as the uh, year unfolded where they would draw that cut line and they also told us that they used um, GCSEs um, sometimes with a contextualization but often not use GCSEs to uh, to help rank uh, applicants by merit and they did this for two reasons one reason was that they were uh, not sure whether the predicted grades that many applicants apply on the basis of were um, likely to uh, materialize come uh, August um, so it was a kind of a sense check as to whether those predicted grades seemed plausible or not but they also used GCSE um, performance because they had so many applicants who on paper were predicted to meet or exceed the entry requirements that they were using them as a way of uh, uh, further differentiating an already highly qualified applicant pool. <clears throat> now, one of the things that was noted by many of our respondents as highly problematic about all of this was that they were well aware that A-level grades are often over-predicted. And in, the, in the, the English system, most people apply uh, with predicted grades. Um, and they were very well aware that certain schools and certain families were, were well attuned to the fact that a strong prediction and maybe even a generous prediction was gonna be really helpful in terms of getting an initial offer of a place. Um, and many, many uh, selectors and heads of admissions told us that it was actually quite common, uh, at least at the time that we spoke to them, that they would make um, offers to quite a substantial proportion of applicants who wouldn't actually go on to meet those advertised grades, the advertised entry requirements. Um, sometimes they ended up ad admitting people who missed by just one grade. Um, other times it was quite a substantial uh, reduction in the published entry requirements uh, that they would go down to at the point of confirmation. And in a sense, this was driven by the need to fill, fill the places and ensure the revenues uh, came in. So that was something that they were aware was very problematic about the, the way they were using grades to, uh, to decide who to admit. And we know from work by uh, Jill Wyness, for example, that among high performers, it's socioeconomically disadvantaged pupils who are less likely to have their grades over predicted. Um, so this practice probably advantaged uh, those from schools and families uh, that, are, that, that were more privileged. They also told us that uh, they set their entry requirements uh, partly um, in response to market forces. So one of the reasons that entry requirements were set so high was to man manage demand. So it wasn't entirely that you needed that level of achievement to do well at the university. They just had too many applicants. So they raised their entry requirements over time. And they were also concerned to think about their market position. So they would look at their close competitors and see what they were setting their entry requirements at. Uh, so as not to be uh, perceived by prospective students as a, a, a lower quality course because they were asking for lower entry requirements. And of course, they were mindful of league table positions as well um, with uh, the, the uh, average A-level and UCAS points of entrance being a, an important part of league tables uh, and the, the supposed quality of institutions. Now we did explicitly ask our interviewees to tell us about what fairness meant to them in relation to admission and 
what was really emphasized was what you might refer to as procedural fairness, this idea that we need to make sure we're treating everybody the same and that we have a standardized procedure. And this involved two elements. They were very concerned to say, well, we think we're fair because we're transparent about what our admissions criteria are, even though they also acknowledged that the fact that they then admit students who didn't actually meet the entry requirements was something that they weren't being transparent about uh, and would likely be called out on um, before too long. But they were very clear that, you know, we've moved to be much clearer about how we process applications and the, the criteria that we use. And we tried to be really consistent. So a lot of universities had moved to more centralized admissions decision-making to try and remove some of the idiosyncrasy of random academics deciding whether they like the, the, the sound of somebody or not. Um, so it was very much about procedural fairness, being transparent, um, being consistent. They did, when, when we asked them about fairness, also talk about distributive fairness concerns, but this was kind of, something that they invariably mentioned after they'd focused on the transparency and consistency and equal treatment um, conception of fairness. So they did talk about the need to recognize that the grades that people have don't mean the same thing, um, that depending on the school that people went to, they might be high performers uh, given how other pupils do in their school. Um, and they talked about increasingly using um, contextual admissions practice practices uh, involving reduced entry requirements for disadvantaged learners to try and um, make sure that they didn't automatically exclude people who had been disadvantaged socially and educationally. Um, and in our sample, all of the old universities used contextual data to assess applicants in some form or another but for half of those universities, it was merely to kind of give a second look at the application uh, rather than to reduce entry requirements. Um, about half of the old universities did re reduce entry requirements for disadvantaged applicants, but only by uh, a couple of grades. And when we asked the, our interviewees what stopped them from acting on this sympathy that they had for distributive fairness and equity of opportunity and the use of contextual uh, admissions uh, and, and reduced offers in particular. Basically what they said to us was that we are, we are concerned that we wouldn't actually be able to support these students, um, that we'd have to fundamentally uh, change our curricula and our teaching practices. Uh, we'd have to fundamentally change uh, the culture within the universities and the attitudes of some of the academics to what it means to educate people at degree level. And people said to us, you know, um, we're actually quite concerned that we, even with the limited contextualization that we're doing, we're not sure that we really are prepared to properly support these students to help them convert that potential into achievement once they're here. Okay. So that's uh, a quick summary of what we found in relation to the interview. So very much a, a, a commitment to the traditional equality of opportunity model, but some sympathy for the equity of opportunity model, but being really limited in being able to fully embrace that because of concerns of uh, that they would be setting students up to fail, that they wouldn't be able to support them fully. If we move on to look at the access and participation plans, the, the documents that universities produced after this call to rethink merit, uh, the first thing that's really striking about these documents is that all um, high tariff universities have set themselves much more ambitious widening access targets than ever before. So you can see here the red bars show what the, the polar quintile five to quintile one ratio was in 2017. And the green bars show you what uh, targets these universities have set for themselves for 2024-25. And you, you'll see that that black line along, uh, going, running along at the level of three is the three to one ratio that the Office for Students has asked them collectively to achieve by 2024, 25. And you'll see that not all universities are promising to get quite to that target, 
although a quick shout out to my own institution, Durham, that has committed to going from a 10 to 1 ratio to a 3 to 1 ratio by 2024. We're very pleased about that. Um, so not all of them are, are, are committing to the, the kind of target uh, that OFS wants, but these are much more ambitious targets uh, than we've ever seen before. And equally importantly, when we look at the access and participation plans and the pros there around these targets, they're very different from the old access agreements. The old access agreements often said, well, we can't do more than a minimal amount of widening access because what can we do? There's just a dearth of qualified applicants from these disadvantaged groups. In these new APPs, the providers are saying, you know, we recognize that we have a long way to go. We recognize that we need to play an important role. We do think we can go faster and further. We recognize that we can do more to be, to have a student body that's much more representative of the wider population than we have currently. So I think this is a real sea change and those who've studied and written about the old access agreements will see this as quite, quite a, a new type of ownership of the, the widening access agenda by higher tariff universities. And I think we see in the access and participation plans too, a greater acknowledgement that attainment and, and grades are not an objective measure of merit, regardless of socioeconomic background. There's a, there's a, a public acknowledgement, a written acknowledgement that they know that socioeconomic circumstances affect achievement and that they uh, should and will start to look uh, more closely at the potential of students uh, that may uh, be unmet uh, today in terms of credentials. And we, what we see in the access and participation plans is many more universities um, engaging with the contextual admissions uh, initiative. Um, several universities are newly introducing contextual offers where entry requirements are reduced for disadvantaged learners. Those that have been doing it for a little while are extending the scope of their contextual admissions policies, sometimes increasing the reduction uh, in, to standard entry requirements that they offer. In other cases, they're broadening out um, the availability of contextual offers so that they're not just for, for people who've done the in-house widening participation scheme, but are for contextually disadvantaged applicants in general. And out of the 25 higher tariff universities in England, there are only four universities, uh, and I've listed them here, uh, that are continuing to require uh, that disadvantaged students meet standard entry requirements. Uh, and these universities you see in their access and participation plans, they're still uh, clinging very tightly to the, uh, the traditional meritocratic equality of opportunity model. Although, you know, Oxford has a, a foundation year that it's developed. I heard in the news today, Cambridge have announced a similar foundation year scheme where they're gonna have a, an additional year of tuition uh, for disadvantaged students uh, to bridge that gap. Um, that, so it's a form of contextualized admissions, um, but perhaps the, in the case of Oxford and Cambridge, they can of course afford to fully fund this for students. Um, so as not to uh, leave disadvantaged students with an extra year of tuition fees and accommodation fees and so on. Um, not all universities are going to be able to take this route. Okay. Now, I think what's really helped, um, what's, what's made possible this um, shift towards a mainstreaming of contextualized admissions is that all of these universities in their access and participation plans are taking, you know, are working quite hard in response to the Office for Students calling out of quite wide disparities in achievement uh, at university, even among those with the same grades, but from different backgrounds. They're really beginning to develop initiatives to su properly support students uh, to succeed. So we see things like pre-sessional programs that are being put in place, um, peer mentoring in the first year, uh, study skills uh, programs throughout um, the degree program to support students, um, the development of academic uh, uh, teaching and learning centers to 
uh, provide students with a, the additional support that they may need to bridge knowledge gaps or uh, skills gaps. Um, and there's a new uh, commitment to more inclusive teaching and learning. So one that tries to meet students where they are rather than requiring students to conform uh, to the model uh, of a kind of traditional student who's fully prepared for university and is able to hit the ground running and uh, succeed uh, more or less regardless of what the, the institution does in the way of teaching and learning. So I think what we've seen is uh, definite steps towards rethinking merit among higher tariff universities. So a movement away from the simple equation of prior, prior achievement being an objective indicator of merit and that expected to translate just as a matter of a, co a course into achievement at degree level through to a greater willingness to recognize that disadvantaged students have a lot of unmet potential that's not reflected in their prior attainment. And crucially, that what's needed is for universities to do much more in the way of supporting students to learn, to make sure that that combination of achieved merit and future potential is translated into success at university. So I'll just leave you with a couple of uh, the recommendations that we had in, uh, in the report. There are more, uh, there are eight in total, but I'll just hone in on three here. Um, and these are what we thought were really the next steps to keep moving in this direction of rethinking merit um, and trying to produce a more equitable uh, system of access to universities general and, and higher tariff universities in particular. And one of the things that we recommend is that universities should um, see this as the beginnings of a process where they should aim to become progressively bolder over time in the use of contextual offers. And we've seen universities that were pioneers of contextual admissions, extend the reach of their contextual offer making, reduce their entry requirements further as they have realized that this is actually something that can work uh, and widen participation without jeopardizing uh, student success. And really critical is the second point that universities really need to make sure that they deliver on these newly inclusive and supportive approaches to teaching and learning. It's very early stages, in fact, that these universities are shifting towards uh, thinking of themselves as educators of students um, and, and supporters of students' learning. Um, they're going to have to, in some ways, become much more like new universities that have long um, been very good at actually educating their students and supporting them to learn rather than you know, lecturing them and then pointing them in the direction of the library uh, and, and then meeting them again in finals three years later. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is that I think universities now have a, a platform, I think, now that everybody's doing contextual admissions more or less, and that there is a real acknowledgement across the sector that, that prior achievement doesn't necessarily indicate um, someone's ability or their merit, that universities really have a role now to play in being the ones who actively champion uh, this new way of thinking about merit and fairness. And I'd really love to see these universities, you know, say loudly and proudly on their websites and in the public domain that they're committed uh, to e equity of opportunity rather than merely formal equality. And that what they're seeking um, is a greater degree of distributive fairness with respect to the allocation of these very valuable places. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I really look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you, Vicky, for that very clear explanation of the research. And I think um, people will now want to get hold of the Narfield report, which Trevor has advertised through the chat. Um, your explanation of the difference between a quality of opportunity approach and equity of opportunity approach was really helpful. Uh, it was worth the extended uh, discussion in the first part of the presentation, I think, for all of us. Uh, and it's, it's very encouraging to know that uh, the Office for Students targets might be achieving some changes in practice. And it's going to be important, I think, isn't it, to hang on to those targets and to, to defend them against any attempt to weaken them or reduce their impact. Um, now we've got a great call list. Uh, um, nine people have indicated they want to ask questions or, or make statements or both. Um, and we've also had a very good take up of the registration with 80 to 85 people participating today. Peter Scott is our first questioner. 
Uh, thanks, Simon, and thanks very much, Vicky. That, that was really good. And like Simon, I think trying to shift the emphasis from former equality of opportunity uh, to uh, a broader sense, a more general sense of equity of opportunity is, is great. And it's good to hear that the university is doing that. But the issue I wanted to raise was something you haven't actually mentioned in your presentation. Um, and that's to do with the choice between area-based metrics, polar, or the one I'm more familiar with, uh, Scottish Index and Multiple Deprivation on the one hand, and individual-based metrics on the other, particularly free school meals. Um, I'm aware, of course, of all the kind of problems you have with area-based metrics. You inevitably get false negatives and false positives. Although, of course, in densely populated urban areas, it's nothing like as bad as it is in large, uh, large uh, rural areas with a much more uh, sparse population. Um, uh, but I, I think it's probably wrong to think that there are problems with individual based metrics as well. <clears throat> I mean, some, I mean, you'll, you'll be aware of, I mean, there are issues just of, of, of data protection, which actually make it difficult. Um, maybe post Brexit, these will disappear, who knows. Um, there are also issues that in the contrast between um, eligibility for free school meals and the actual take up of school meals. What we will be measuring here will be the take up of school meals. So that does mean, and there are significant variations, you're dependent on how uh, good local authorities and schools are actually encouraging take up of free school meals. Um, but the main point I wanted to pick up is that um, the actual variation among people who have free school meals in terms of their participation in higher education. I mean, I think it's right to say that basically someone in London on free school meals is three times more likely to participate in higher education than someone from the Northeast. Now, there are lots of factors you can think of there. <clears throat> I mean, the levels of school achievement, um, uh, perhaps ethnic mixes and so on, um, but it's probably difficult to imagine there aren't some kind of broader cultural background community factors, which actually allow someone in London to be more aspirational, to achieve more uh, to, uh, than someone in the Northeast. So in a sense, you're driven back to a sense of community, what's going on in these communities. So I think, Individual based metrics also have their own issues. Um, I mean, ideally one should have a mix of both, um, but that's quite difficult for funding bodies and uh, agencies and national governments because they want a kind of a clean metric that no one can game really and everyone can is, is playing by the same rules. Um, and I think these aren't simply technical questions. Um, I think if you focus exclusively on individual based metrics, Ultimately, you never get completely free away from the idea of what you're trying to do here is address a deficit in academic preparation for higher education. Now, you can be much more generous in how you approach that, but it's still actually focusing on the deficit of the individual. Um, if you focus more on the area, the community, then you are raising broader issues about multi-generational kind of community embedded kind of multiple forms of deprivation. And whether universities, particularly in their localities and regions, have any responsibility for actually addressing those sort of issues as well, not just picking on the individuals. So I think there are sort of broader issues as well, alongside the technical issues. Anyway, I loved, I loved your presentation. I really look forward to reading your report. Thank you. Maybe I could just respond to the, the, the what you mentioned about uh, in London, for example, that um, free school meal uh, pupils being much more likely to go to university than where, where I am in the Northeast. And I think many of the things that you mentioned are relevant factors, including commu uh, local community, culture, and so on. But also opportunity is really relevant there as well. So in London, you have many universities, including many high tariff universities. It's not so difficult to, to aspire to, to connect with, uh, to, go, to, to consider it possible to go to one of those universities much less opportunity uh, where I am in, in the Northeast. Um, and critically, you know, universities like my, my own have not necessarily reached out to local communities very much and invited them in. In fact, they've, they've drawn their students mainly from London and the South, haven't they? So you have to think about opportunity. And I think there's an important role for area uh, ways of thinking about this when we think about the responsibility that universities have to disadvantage people locally. Um, so I think that could be where individual level and area level considerations um, can come together in a really useful way. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there uh, on that point. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, look, thanks, Peter, for your really interesting contribution too. Um, Newella, Newella Burgess has got the next question. 
hello, sorry, sorry about that. Um, Vicky, thanks, absolutely great as always, absolutely brilliant. Two points I wanted to pick up in particular was um, the point that you made that attainment and grades are not an accurate reflection of students' academic ability. And also what I want to propose here on foundation years, and I take the point about cost, is that it would, um, the introduction of a foundation would address fears that certain groups won't keep up or that we're setting them up to fail in elite universities. And I thought as an approach to improving equity of opportunity and better informed contextual admissions, I wondered if there wouldn't be some advantage to helping working class and disadvantaged young people to access elite universities through providing a free foundation year. My own experience of working with particular groups of disadvantage, I'm thinking Somali sixth formers I've worked with, and first year undergraduates suggests that many students from poorer backgrounds, they don't lack the academic ability and some are but they do lack some basic skills in uh, good essay writing, how to evaluate and argue. They can get A-levels, but they're not quite hitting the, the ways of approaches, approaching essay writing, for example. Basic knowledge they lack in how to use libraries, and would you believe databases? These students also happen to work while they study. So it means any lack in basic academic skills is exaggerated. Look, we could lever up the playing field, I feel, with a free foundation year for some groups. And I think a free foundation year provided by the richer elite universities would show that they were serious about improving fair admissions and widening participations. If you like, I'm asking elite universities to put their money where their mouth is. Indeed, I, I would wholly support that. I mean, I, foundation years, I think are fantastic. We've had one for a long time at Durham and it does amazing things. Um, and it's very successful. And I think, I think they are uh, the way to go, but they're also in, as they're set up currently outside of the very rich universities of Oxford and Cambridge, they're not free to students. And so that gives me a little bit of concern about passing the, the cost uh, onto, onto disadvantaged students. I'd, I mean, it'd be interesting to explore whether uh, higher tariff universities that, are, that don't have massive endowments actually do have the finances to, to fund or at least part fund this, perhaps with uh, the Department for Education co-funding it. Um, obviously, there was a not so long ago um, a desire to, to kind of pull back on foundation years because they're seen as a more costly alternative to uh, access to HE programmes. But we know that foundation years work really well and that they integrate students into the university really well too, uh, when, they're, when they're done well, that is. Um, so yeah, I think absolutely foundation years free at the, at the point of delivery would be a great way to go. Whether that can be res resourced by the average higher tariff university, I don't know. But other solutions might be to have summer bridging programs, right? And some universities are doing pre-sessional courses now. Um, but that needs to be done over maybe a longer period of time and you know really intensively uh, and done well to, to actually make a difference. Um, and I think we may need to go down that route because the, the, the small reductions in entry requirements that we see at the moment are only gonna get us so far on widening access. So it's really up to universities to think about how can they step up to help bridge that gap for students. Uh, and they're going to need to do more over, to, over time, I think, and that's one obvious uh, way, way to go. Thanks, Vicky, thank you. Thanks, Nirala, and thank you, Vicky. Uh, and you've got 11 questions in the um, chat, which I think is a CG web webinar record. Um, oh, wonderful. The previous record was nine. So we've also got some more comments as well, very positive, I might say. So keep an eye on that chat after the webinar because you won't, we won't have time to get to every question and you may want to have an email conversation with yeah. some of the questioners. Can we bring in Greg Walker? Greg. Yeah, thanks, Simon. And thanks, Vicky, for an excellent presentation. Really enjoyed it. So uh, uh, just a question, really, I suppose, reflecting on how ideological patterns tend to go, come across the prong from America to the UK. And you'll be aware of the controversies over affirmative action in America and want to be very clear to distinguish the sort of um, political uh, resistance there is in some quarters to affirmative action in America and contextual admissions in the UK. And you will recall as well as I 
uh, I, I do. The initial Hefsky report on contextual admissions back, I think, in 2008, 2009, which I think focused its justification uh, uh, for contextual offers on the finding that lower attainment socially disadvantaged students caught up with their um, sort of higher attaining upper socioeconomic status groups during the course of their degree program and ended up roughly in the same place. And that sort of plays to a formal equality um, justification, I think, for contextual admissions. And I think, to be fair, that appealed to people like David Willits at the time um, when he became university's minister and hence contextual admissions was was, was, was accepted within that uh, coalition government sort of uh, approach to HE. But do you think there's been an evolution? I suppose you don't have a time series in your survey, so you can't compare how there's been an evolution of approach from this perspective of the university. But do you think there's been an, evolu an evolution of approach whereby universities are now seeing an intrinsic merit to a socially diverse student body, which is the fundamental justification for affirmative action in America, albeit in the case of race rather than socioeconomic status. And do you think it's that that's causing more the sort of culture war resistance to the notion of contextual emissions in certain parts of the press? Has there been, do you think, a, an evolution from a sort of formal equality, the catch up effect within a degree programme, more towards the notion that there's an intrinsic desirability to a diverse student body? I haven't really seen that, no. I mean, I, we don't really have conversations about the value of a diverse classroom. Um, perhaps we do more so around uh, race and ethnicity, but, but we rarely have these conversations in, in relation to socioeconomic background. Um, and I guess that's a, an important area to champion, isn't it? And, and to, you know, to think about meeting people from other walks of life is a really valuable aspect of the educational experience. And they are really good in America at really showing that how that adds to everybody's learning um, and it could also be a good antidote to the very elitist cultures that we often hear reported about at high tariff universities where there's a, a concentration of uh, highly privileged individuals who've never really interacted with anyone else who's not highly privileged and you know we the, the, there was something in the Guardian not so long ago uh, about a Durham student who's from the Northeast who had uh, surveyed a lot of other people from the Northeast uh, at Durham who reported uh, experiencing uh, comments about their accent, people saying, oh, you must be uh, on benefits. Do you, oh, do you have a washing machine in your house? You know, really kind of uh, toxic kind of comments about people who are not like them. And clearly diversifying uh, the, the, the student population is really necessary to tr try and counteract those stereotypes that, that privileged students sometimes hold if they've never really been outside of their privileged bubble. So just for kind of the, uh, besides the educational value, just the kind of personal value of having a more diverse uh, community can't be overstated. And I think we're really behind the curve in, um, pushing that line of argument uh, around why we should widen access, why we should use contextual admissions and so on. So I think it's a conversation that we haven't yet started, but we really need to have that one. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Yes, thanks, Greg. And, and Johnny Rich is our next contributor. Thanks very much, Simon, and thanks, Vicky. Um, fantastic uh, work, as always. Um, I've got two questions, but I'll keep them both very quick. One is very theoretical and the other is quite particular. On the theoretical one, I'm interested in um, comparing the equality and equi equity um, models in terms of fairness, but there's also an argument perhaps in terms of um, public benefit or, or public return on investment in that um, the added value for the taxpayer is far greater in um, investing in somebody less credentialed than in somebody investing in somebody who's more credentialed and has more social capital and frankly um if they want to learn they probably can anyway and if they want to earn they probably will uh, so perhaps you know just putting it out there as a hypothetical should should the government um be providing a lot less support to um highly credentialed students and actually um, investing far more heavily in supporting students who don't have credentials uh, for the sake of the public purse. 
Uh, my other question was um, about the OFS consultation that's out at the moment on um, quality and standards and the proposal to have a baseline of um, quality uh, that is not contextualized and they're being very explicit that uh, contextualization of of that baseline measured according to outcomes outcomes being um, uh, progression rates and and earning earnings uh, do you think that this is um, going to counteract efforts on access and participation that the other side of OFS is trying to do let me take the second one first then, uh, Johnny. Good to see you, by the way. Um, I haven't read that in the consultation in full, but you know, I think there's a trade-off that's, or there's a delicate balance, I suppose, in um, recognizing that it's the socioeconomic circumstances of students impacts on their progression, their achievement, their graduate outcomes on the one hand, and pushing universities to close that gap. Um, to take effort to take steps to close that gap and I guess that's what the Office for Students is trying to do is to say you know it's not desirable and acceptable to have these uh, large inequalities of outcome and we want you to be taking steps to do something about it even though it's not you know entirely about uh, the standard of, uh, of the education that you're offering um, so I think it is a it is a delicate balance to go to go to your first point though around uh, the equality versus equity uh, debate and thinking about the investment in socioeconomically disadvantaged students who may have lower grades be yielding a bigger return. Um, I think that's an important argument to make and I think you're quite right that higher tariff universities mainly educate very advantaged individuals who are probably going to be fine educationally and occupationally and, it, and it's it's quite likely that a lot of the return to a Russell Group degree is actually to do with uh, the mm -hmm. families of the students that go there rather than that the inputs of the universities. It's probably, you know, it's the, the circumstances of the students coupled with the badge of prestige uh, that, that comes with having gone to the university rather than the content of the, of the course really. Um, so yeah, I think there's definitely a value added argument to be made there. Thanks, Thank Johnny. Uh, our next question is from um, Jess Brown. Um, hi there, Vicky. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I'm a doctoral student at uh, Oxford Brookes University in Education, uh, and I'm particularly interested in access to higher education. Uh, and I've been really fascinated by Diane Ray and Stephen Ball and others, uh, other sort of Bordeauxian scholars. Um, as you indicated, universities have an important role to play in developing as yet unrealized potential. Uh, to what extent do you uh, think that is entirely concerned with admissions and how far do you think that elite universities need to work harder to develop their cultural environment as a competing priority um, in order for everyone uh, for everyone but students from lower SES uh, in particular to realize their full potential thanks Jess so I assume by cultural environment you mean not like what happens in the classroom in terms of pedagogy but the climate I on campus yeah exactly that yeah absolutely and i think that, that they're beginning to grapple with this by thinking about inc more inclusive cultures within the university starting first with the teaching and learning um practices of of academic staff um who are often from uh privileged backgrounds themselves although obviously not exclusively um but that does need to filter through to students as well right it does need to filter through to the wider campus climate um, and I think universities are beginning to, and I state, you know, underline beginning, beginning to realise that there are some quite toxic cultures that go on around racism, classism, uh, sexual violence as well. You know, we, we, we see periodic media um, reports about th things that have happened uh, in WhatsApp groups and, 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 and students, you know, historically not being dealt with um, very severely. Uh, when those things have come to light. Increasingly, I think universities are taking a tougher stance on that, but there's quite a lot of work to do, I think, to create an inclusive culture. Um, I go back to what I said before about, you know, universities that have mainly privileged students who have always been with other privileged students are in need of some kind of educating really about 
the fact that people who are not like them are not less than them, <laughs> for want of a better word. So absolutely, I think that's got to be part of the picture. Otherwise, you know, non-traditional students, low socioeconomic students come to these universities, they get their degrees, but they have a miserable time uh, because of the behaviours of others around them. Thank you. Yeah, I also think there's something in um, uh, working restrictions, uh, particularly, I'm not sure about Cambridge, but Oxford uh, doesn't allow undergraduates mm. to work during term time, um, which for, for many working class and SES students mm. um, is, is fundamental to be able to support themselves whilst at university. Uh, and it seems like uh, having those kind of restrictions in place in such a stringent way is a massive barrier mm -hmm. um, to even working class students uh, thinking that they could apply in order to financially afford their way through university. So thank you so much for, for your answer. Thank you. And thanks, Jess. I think our last question will have to, will be from Camille Kanduko Hassan, and I'll have to apologise to Rosemary, Helen, David, Cassandra, Elizabeth, and Lauren who won't be able to take part in the Q&A today. Vicky, you might take the opportunity yes. when you answer to make any final comments too. So uh, Camille. Thanks, Simon. Vicky, thanks for a great presentation. Um, I've done research that had quite similar findings. And so what I was interested in was, did you explore or find differences across subject areas, um, both in terms of the processes that departments went through, but also the kind of conceptions of fairness across different kind of disciplinary communities. Because I know there's different disciplinary practices with you know, admissions tests being very common in maths and other STEM subjects, um, but both whether those practices seem to impact approaches to conceptual data, but also just the notion of what kind of equality and fairness means across kind of broad subject areas. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I guess the main thing that springs to mind is the distinction between natural sciences and other subjects. And you mentioned maths there. And I think this idea that you've got to have an A star at A level maths and further maths to even have a chance of knowing what the first lecture on the first day means, you know, was a real sticking point for uh, natural science selectors. You know, they really thought that you absolutely had to have that level of achievement. There was no way that if you had anything less that you could even be in scope for ever understanding it. Uh, and there was a kind of, a conception that what they would have to do to bring that student up to speed would be remedial education, right? So there's very, very much a deficit view of what that meant to not have that A star in maths and further maths. Um, and, you know, I understand that, you know, maths is a very linear um, uh, subject that you, that, you, that you can't come in at this level if you haven't got the building blocks. Um, but hopefully, you know, universities are increasingly realizing that they can put those building blocks in place. Um, it's perhaps relevant that Imperial College, uh, which is a, sci a pure science um, uh, institution, is one of the four that are not going to be reducing entry requirements uh, and um, in their access and participation plan were, were quite wedded to that traditional meritocratic equality of opportunity model and grades being the be all and end all. So um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your uh, uh, comments and questions. And I will have a look through the chat uh, and, and follow up with those who didn't get a chance to ask, answer their question. So thank you so much. Thank you, Vicky. I mean, I think this has been a brilliant session. And um, the, the way in which you go about your work, the clarity and carefulness with which you explain everything and the patience and listening skills, as well as the speaking skills, really appreciated in this Q&A. Um, so we want to have you back. Uh, to talk about these issues as they develop um, and they and the UK discussion is one that's watched in other countries too. Um, so folks do get hold of the Nuffield report and do keep an eye on what Vicky's doing because what she's doing is very important I think. Um, next uh, webinar is takes us to Hong Kong and it's uh, next Tuesday and we have uh, Hugo Horta and William Lowe, two very very good scholars of higher education um, Hong Kong is an important place. It's, uh, it's a portal between East and West. It's these very, very different worlds as they are uh, in universities and in general. Uh, and we really need uh, good universities in Hong Kong playing that portal role. Um, and uh, Hugo and uh, William will talk to us about that. So we look forward to seeing you all again uh, next, uh, next week and bye for now and take care.